All right, good afternoon, and welcome to our event, Will Broadband Be Affordable? Assessing the Regulations of Broadband Subsidies. I'm Mark Jamison, a non-resident senior fellow with the American Enterprise Institute. On November 15th, 2021, President Joe Biden signed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. It included $42.5 billion for broadband development under what is called the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, or BEAD. The NTIA, the National Telecommunications Information Administration, oversees the program, but states are doing the heavy lifting, including determining which broadband providers will receive money and under what conditions. NTIA has a number of requirements for the states, including restrictions on broadband pricing. NTIA is telling states to require low-cost pricing options, suggesting strongly that $30 a month is the right number. NTIA is also requiring states to ensure that broadband is affordable for middle-class households. NTIA's middle-class affordability requirement is, uh, has a lot more flexibility than the low-cost requirement, but one of its suggestions is to offer that $30 per month fee for everybody that we would consider middle-class. Other NTIA ideas include subsidies for middle-class households, states developing pricing benchmarks, and regulations promoting structural competition. And there's more. In 2023, the Government Accountability Office reported that in addition to BEAD, there are 11 other federal programs on broadband affordability. States and NTIA would ideally, at least in some sense, consider how their affordability efforts comply or fit with or interact with those 11 other programs, and states and NTIA should study why those 11 programs have some sense failed, uh, because that then would create the need for additional low-income and middle-class affordability efforts. And one more thing. Just last week, the FCC chairperson announced her intent to reinstitute Title II regulation for broadband providers. If that happens, this is the regulation for, uh, that we developed back in the 1930s for monopoly telephone companies. Well, if that happens, it's anyone's guess as to what those new regulations would look like for broadband. As anyone who's worked in business, studied economics, or obtained an MBA knows, business is complex and dynamic, especially in the online world. Businesses constantly experiment with technologies, products, and prices to learn what will succeed both today and in the future. So what hope is there that the states and NTIA can establish price controls that make sense today and for the foreseeable future? And how can states develop practices that both satisfy NTIA and work in the marketplace? So here to discuss these issues are four experts in broadband policy, economics, and finance. With us are Jonathan Chaplin, lead analyst with New Street Research, he has previously re lead research, he previously led research teams at Credit Suisse and JP Morgan. Michelle Connolly, she's a professor of practice and economics at Duke University. She's twice served as chief economist for the Federal Communications Commission. John Horrigan, a Benton Senior Fellow, Benton Institute for Broadband and Society. John has had a distinguished career at Pew, the Technology Policy Institute, McKinsey and Company, and the FCC. And John Mayo. Elsa Carlson uh, Don McDonough, Chair of Business Administration, Georgetown University. He's also Executive Director for the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy, and he's well known for his scholarship in regulatory economics. So Jonathan, Michelle, John H., and John M., welcome. I feel like <laughs> <laughs> so I have a few questions for each of you, and around 3.10, We'll open the floor for questions from our audience. And let's keep in mind that uh, a lot of people in our audience are not going to be deeply into BEAD, so we'll keep the discussion general. Uh, to our audience, if you have questions, our online audience, uh, email them to Kate um, Beinkampen at aei.org. That is spelled K-A-T-E dot B-E-I-N-K-A-M-P-E-N at aei.org, or tweet them or X them to us at hashtag AskAEITech, A-S-K-A-E-I-T-E-C-H. So John H., let's begin with you. 
you've looked into broadband affordability issues for several years, and you've studied BEAD, and you're involved in a lot of discussions about this, please lay the groundwork for us by describing NTIA's low-cost affordability requirements. I'll come back to you to get your thoughts on those, um, but right now, just give us a, a place to start, please. Okay, for the low-cost affordability requirements in the, the BEAD guidance, um, NTIA is asking states to have a plan by which B recipients make plans affordable to low-income households. And they say, for instance, um, you could have uh, eligibility requirements of 200% of the federal poverty level for a $30 per month uh, plan at 100, uh, 100 megabits per second download speed, 20 upload speed. Um, so that's an awful lot like the current eligibility requirements for the ACP, another acronym, the Affordable Connectivity Program, which is a $14.2 billion program that provides a $30 per month subsidy to qualifying low-income households. Again, 200% of federal poverty level for ACP. There are some additional qualifications, uh, eligibility criteria that expand that eligibility set beyond 200% of the federal policy uh, poverty level, such as participating in SNAP or SSI or, or Medicaid. So when NTIA for the low income plan uh, lays out these requirements, they're mirror, mirroring ACP to a large extent, in my view, and we can talk later, if you'd like, about um, how ACP is going. Um, I can talk a little bit about the middle class part, if you'd like. Yes. Um, to me, that reads a little bit vague. Um, it's saying that for the middle class, which is you know, not defined in their guidance, um, there should be a $30 per month plan available, um, and it doesn't go much beyond that. It strikes me that uh, when you start to think about what qualifies as the middle class, some analysts will put that at um, uh, a household income level uh, at, um, say, two-thirds of the poverty level to, I think, um, two and a half times the, the median income. Um, you're getting a fairly large set of potential uh, beneficiaries of, of that plan. Probably, if you look into the data on how many people are disconnected when you start to get um, above the median household income, they're not that many. So in fact, ACP would do most of the work that that rather vaguely defined middle class uh, plan asks uh, of, of states to do. So it is a little bit vague um, and um, sort of that's my reading of it. Uh, also that you know, if, you, if you really uh, go into the adoption data, there's probably not much of a problem at that level of income such that you would um, try to define something in this fashion. Okay, so as I understand what's going on is that NTIA for the low income, the low cost, it's going down a fairly well-worn path. We've, we've been down this in many ways over many, many years. Middle class, that's kind of new, so that's, they've got some general ideas, but they're, they're not nailing things down. Yes. Okay, very good, I appreciate that. So Michelle, let me ask you then, there's been a lot of research over the years over affordability. How do you know and what kind of, of rules help with affordability? You've been involved in some of that research. As a scholar, you've studied pretty much all of it. What does the scholarship say and how does it inform your thoughts on what we're doing in this particular moment? So, I mean, one of the key things to think about is the difference between affordability and willingness to pay. Mm -hmm. right. uh, for me, you know, the beautiful house on the beach uh, with private access is, it's, should be more affordable, but right, that, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, the government should subsidize my purchase. All right, so that's a little bit flippant, but where I want to shift from, away from using the word affordability to, to this notion of willingness to pay is how much do people value things? And there, is, there are quite a few papers out there. Um, uh, Greg Rostin and Scott Walston are among, have a paper in particular that had looked at um, uh, a service called um, Internet Essentials that was uh, started by Comcast. And they estimated for low-income households who were eligible at the time, this was in 2011, 
to uh, subscribe to this $10 a month subscription, uh, they found that the elasticity of demand, so how much you change your demand as, as the, the price changes, um, was very, very low. Uh, in economic terms, something that has an elasticity greater than one is considered fairly elastic. Less than one is considered fairly inelastic. Their estimate you, from that group was that elasticity was, in, in absolute magnitude, 0.11, right? So we're talking very low elasticity of demand. And I've done some work on this as well, um, not published yet, but looking at kind of the drivers of adoption in low, lower household income households. And price is not the main driver. Um, is what we're, we're observing. What we're observing is uh, factors that affect relevance, age being the primary one. So age seems to drive m uh, adoption more than anything else. Um, and then other factors have to do with kind of whether you have children or not, which is kind of self-evident. Um, but pricing is important, but it's not the, the top thing. And even uh, citing back to the Rostin and Walston paper, what they showed was, so this was a, a, a new program that had been introduced to increase adoption. And what they were able to estimate is that about 66% of the people who joined already were likely to already have this policy, uh, to already have internet service uh, at the home. So when you're having um, programs that are subsidizing, one issue is to go, okay, we care about low-income households, let's give you a transfer. And that's fine. Um, there's is another thing to say, we're giving this because you would not otherwise purchase or subscribe to internet service. So some of what's happening is that uh, some of this money is creating true, like, so the ACP, is allowing for true new adoption. Some of this money is now being used to subsidize people who already had service. And I actually forgot your question. Um, <laughs> oh, affordability. All right. Uh, I, everything I say is very memorable. I appreciate your pointing <laughs> that out. So, um, so my concern, are, like, there are a couple of things. One thing to point out, so ACP now offers $30 a month subsidy. Before that, a lot of the major internet service providers offered low-income household subscriptions for $20 a month. Now that's gone up to 30. Let's guess why, right? Um, but if this money is in part subsidizing uh, service that people, households are actually willing to pay, then it's not entirely clear how much you know, we should be uh, subsidizing that or not, and whether, you know, no matter how much we throw at it, there's still going to be some households who will never adopt. So that's kind of my big picture takeaway. Okay, so as I understand it, we, we've had some efforts of subsidizing broadband before, and they've been studied. And, and the people who've conducted the studies have found that the customers, even low-income households, are not real sensitive to the price. Uh, the, the subsidy doesn't make a, a big impact for them, okay? And, and so it's, it's other things that, that tend to then move the needle. Um, all right, so let me, I'm going to turn to John uh, Mayo next, but uh, John H., I want you to, to be thinking about an issue she raised, and that is if you subsidize someone who already has a service, what then happens with that money? What impacts does it have? Okay, so John, John Mayo, you've, you've been involved with other types of subsidies in telecommunications going back further. <laughs> you've studied it greatly. Some of your doctoral students have studied it. <clears throat> what have you and your students <clears throat> learned over time? Well, um, let me say this. I, we're here to talk about BEAD, not my research. I'd love to talk about my research all day. But, <clears throat> but I think your question does raise a really very important question, that is, and this follows up on what Michelle was talking about, is what have we learned from prior attempts, prior assessments 
of long-standing efforts to increase deployment and adoption in telecommunications and broadband services. <clears throat> and I think maybe at the risk of oversimplifying the results from the literature, let me, let me point out three things uh, with respect to subsidy programs. Uh, number one, uh, efficient subsidy programs uh, really need to be, have a singular goal and the subsidies need to be explicit. Uh, subsidy programs that, that either by intent or by implementation uh, become all things to all people effectively lose their efficiency and lose their effectiveness. Uh, and we've seen that over time. So, so we need to be very clear about the, the goal of these programs over time. With respect to the BEAD program, which we are here to talk about, um, the statutory language actually, I think, is pretty clear uh, that there's a, uh, an intent, a, a clear intent, to promote the deployment of broadband to unserved areas in this country. Uh, the risk we run, the risk we run is not in the, in the statute, I think, but rather the implementation. In the implementation, we run the risk of having the goals diluted and morph into, into larger goals. A, a good example might be the, the uh, feature that you spoke about a minute ago, Mark, uh, of the, the suggestion of a, a $20, uh, or I'm sorry, $30, yeah. $30 low cost program. That price is determined or is going to be negotiated between the Assistant Secretary of Commerce and, and the eligible entities. If that price is too low, if that price is driven too low, then you're going to wind up with implicit subsidies that aren't called subsidies, but they're an implicit subsidy, and that's going to dilute the effectiveness of the program. So that's, that's number one. Number two, second lesson I think to be learned from the literature is that subsidy, efficient subsidy programs are, let's call it broadly funded and narrowly targeted. Uh, uh, and we have learned that from a set of really failed attempts <laughs> over the years that have done just the opposite, that have, have uh, tried to give a subsidy to everybody and have funded it through distortions on telecommunication services. Uh, so, so here, the, again, the good news is this is, as far as I know, the, fur, the BEAD program is the first program to actually be funded broadly out of, out of general tax revenues. And that, that's a plus. That, that's a plus. Uh, the danger, I think, of the BEAD program right now, again, is not in the, in the statute per se, but in the, in the prospective implementation, and that is the issue of narrowly targeting. If we move beyond the low-income subscribers that are, let's call those marginal subscribers, subscribers who, but for the subsidy, would not subscribe to broadband. If we move beyond that to the middle class, which John spoke about, there you're moving into what economists refer to as inframarginal customers. Inframarginal customers are customers, households, that are going to subscribe anyway, in which case the funding hasn't really accomplished the goal, but really only has transferred revenue. So I think that's, that's another very important lesson. Final lesson, let me just say quickly, is that we have learned over the years that the very best efficient subsidy mechanisms are truly competitively awarded. That means, and I'll just draw a simple example of, of uh, whether a state uh, awards a grant based on uh, a, an application process. Who has the prettiest application? Economists oftentimes refer to these as beauty contests. Are, 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 are these awards going to be based on a beauty contest or are they going to be based on a competitive bidding process? And economists in this case typically favor the idea of a reverse auction in which bidders would say, I will supply broadband service in this unserved area for X dollars. And I'll provide for X minus delta dollars. I'll provide for X minus delta minus epsilon dollars. And there you get the most efficient subsidy mechanism. So I think there are some lessons from the current research, Mark. All right, thank you for explaining that because there's we've had a long history and we've we've mm -hmm. 
learn some things uh, along the way. Not always do we follow up on what we've learned, but um, sometimes we do. Um, Michelle, he brought up an issue about if you have a mechanism that's kind of broad, affects a lot of people, that then brings a lot more stakeholders into supporting that mechanism down the road. Uh, I'd like for you to talk about that in, in a moment if I could. It's that basic issue that the more people who benefit from a program, the harder it is to change it and unravel it at some point in the future. Uh, but first I want to go to, to John Horrigan, get his thoughts, and then I need to, to also ask Jonathan about some of the financial issues. Then we'll come to that stakeholder type uh, question. So um, John H., you've listened to, to Michelle and, and, and John Mayo's thoughts. Um, I'm going to turn, like I said, to, to Jonathan in a moment for the financial perspective, but you have been more on the front lines than any of us on broadband affordability. What are your thoughts now, listening to them and all the work that you've done? What, where do you think this plays? Let me start out by talking about some work I did a few years ago on Comcast Internet Essentials program. It was a survey of a random sample of Internet Essentials subscribers, and we found a couple of things about what getting connected via Internet Essentials meant to them. First, the sample showed that um, just about a third of those in the sample had had broadband before. So some had had experience as subscribers in the past. Some were new to getting online with a home wireline subscription with Internet Essentials. And that underscores the fact that there's a set of uh, low-income households in this country that I call the subscription vulnerable. They're on and off the network, often depending on the vicissitudes of their um, economic lives. They hit a bump in the road, they might have to give up internet service. So they're the churn subscribers, to use a term carriers might use. We also found that 90% um, of this sample of internet, uh, internet essential subscribers had service. It was a wireless broadband service. So they had service. They were getting, in many cases, for the first time, a wireline subscription at home. And that really, the research showed, changed their psychology about being connected. Um, the steady, uncapped nature of connectivity that they got via Internet Essentials um, made them more comfortable doing things online, such as educational applications, looking for work, seeking out training on how to use the Internet. And we had a longitudinal design, and I won't get too far into the weeds, but it did show over time substantial impacts due to getting service with this uh, program, um, which in most cases supplemented a wireless service that they had. So um, the um, subsidy itself, or the low-cost offer that Comcast um, offered them, um, really was um, something that they seemed to value, as our research showed. And it probably meant that they were able to, because there is other research that shows that uh, many households give up some consumption in order to afford broadband. In the case of this example with Internet Essentials, it's likely that um, with the cut rate plan, they were able to not just do more things online, but um, you know, maybe have more discretionary income for other um, for other goods or services. So this example, I think, applies to how we ought to think about uh, what is going on with the Affordable Connectivity Program in terms of the dynamics of what that subsidy means for these households. Okay, so as I understand what you were saying is that while a lot of people might already have broadband, the subsidy then is just kind of a more disposable income, more income they can use for other things. Uh, in the old telephone world, we found that to be true as well. When we subsidized low income, they already had service. And in that case, the additional money actually went to buy more communication services. Did you find any of that? We did find actually a modest impact in terms of people buying more hardware, uh, tablets or, or uh, computers with that extra income. OK, all right, very good. Well, thank you. So Jonathan, uh, thank you for all your patience. Uh, if you've listened to uh, policy wonks and economists talk about these things, let's, let's look at a, a, a uh, financial perspective. So you have described the BEAD program as effectively trying to use government subsidies to attract private capital. 
as you look at some of the requirements, the thoughts that NTIA has on what it would like the states to do, how does that affect the, um, the financial market's willingness to participate? But then also, uh, just for our audience members that have not been involved in, in financing projects before, explain why the, the subsidy even matters, how it attracts private capital, et cetera. Thank sure. you. Sure. Um, so I think there's sort of three points that I'd make. Mark, number one is we've got an historic opportunity to close the broadband divide once and for all. Um, there's enough money here to ensure that happens. It's not going to cost $42.5 billion. It's going to cost about double that. The other half has to come um, from private capital. Um, if the rules are implemented in a way that's attractive to private capital, we don't ever have to talk about the access problem again after this problem, after this, these funds have been, been administered. Um, number two is that the returns that private capital are going to get from participating in the bead process and deploying infrastructure to close the gap are compelling, but they're not phenomenal. We're not talking about the kind of returns you get from in, investing in an, in an internet company. Uh, returns on invested capital in the mid to high teens we're talking about a cost of capital for the industry, um, somewhere between sort of high single digits and low teens. And so there's a margin that private investors will get from bidding on the bead funds, putting their own private capital against it, and deploying infrastructure to call it 14 million homes and businesses in, in the country. It takes about six years um, for private capital to break even on that investment. And so you're really investing in stuff. This is an attractive investment because you're investing in inf infrastructure that's going to be around for 20, 30 years. You're going to make a loss um, for the, the first six, seven, eight of those years, and you start to make a return in the years, years thereafter. So the, 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 there's a compelling return here, but there's, under the right circumstances, you can't do things that sort of mess with that return much before you make it. Uh, uneconomic for private capital to come in. The third thing I think, and, and this is really the thing that sort of cuts through all of the noise and the chaos that surrounds this topic. There's a lot of muddled thinking that makes it difficult for, I think, policymakers to know what they're meant to do with a set of rules. <coughs> the third thing is that you need to implement a hierarchy of objectives. So, Michelle mentioned we've got like three different things that prevent people from getting online. It's they, they don't understand the benefits as an education problem. John sort of referenced the second issue, which is as an affordability problem, they can't afford it. And then there's an access problem. There's a natural hierarchy amongst these three things. If we educate everyone to the sort of pinnacle of education possibilities, and they totally understand how important it is um, to be connected, but they can't afford it, or there's no infrastructure in their, in their area, it doesn't matter. You've accomplished nothing. Um, similarly, if you give people free service, but there's no infrastructure in their area, we've accomplished nothing. So the natural hierarchy is, first, solve the access problem. Second, solve the affordability problem. And third, solve the, um, uh, the, the education problem. And that, you know, th that's as, as clear as day. There shouldn't be any dispute about which, which order we want to solve these problems in. What I know is we've got enough money to solve the first problem, which is the access problem. If we've solved the access problem and there's money left over, it's meant to go towards those other things. Um, but let's make sure that we, we solve the access problem first. So sorry, that was a very long-winded way that's to okay. get back to the... No. The, the sort of the, the thrust of your question, which is what should we be doing in the context of these NTIA rules around affordability? It's, it's actually super clear once you understand the problem in these terms. Um, don't do anything that will deplete the returns on, a, on private capital such that we don't get private capital coming in to solve the access problem. Um, and, and so what does that mean? The, can we have uh, a low-income uh, mandate as part of the rules. Yes, we can, as long as it's thoughtfully and narrowly defined, um, really targeting households that wouldn't get access but, for, um, but for, for this mandate. If it's thoughtfully constructed, 
um, as ACP has been, um, it's actually going to expand the market, not narrow the market. It'll be a good thing for the people deploying uh, capital and infrastructure rather than a bad thing. A vaguely worded um, middle class mandate um, you know, makes no sense at all. The way I read that, and you know, I'm the, the guy on this panel who's not the policy guy, so this might be wrong. The, the way I read that was as a, a sort of a vague suggestion to the states, not something that they have to implement. Um, my advice to the states um, would be uh, to ignore that. It has a real danger of negatively impacting um, private capital coming in to help fix this problem. Okay, so thank you for, for explaining. Um, so as I understand it, one of the, the issues that the state should think about is if they have restrictions that lower the possible returns on the investment, that means that more subsidy is going to be needed if you want that area covered. More subsidy is going to be needed, and you just might not get to all the homes in your, um, in your state that require subsidy. So there's sort of a fixed pool of subsidies available, an awful lot of homes that need to be collect, uh, connected. Um, if you lower the amount of private capital that's going to come in, it just means we're not going to, we're, we're not going to close the gap. Or we're going to close it through um, suboptimal means, mm -hmm. um, like you know, via satellite or um, other sort of suboptimal services that aren't as, aren't, aren't as good as fiber. Okay. There's one other thing you said that I want to follow up on, and it was that this is an opportunity we can make the investments now, we don't have to worry about it going into the future. And I, I want to ask about that because the US is kind of late to the game in doing subsidies this way. This has been done in a lot of other countries. And the basic challenge that the countries look at is, you know, it costs, let's say, $150 a month to serve someone with broadband. They're only willing to pay 70, so you need an $80 subsidy. And that, that's then they, they have people compete to make sure the numbers are all right. And, and as John was indicating, uh, try to get that subsidy amount down as low as possible. But some countries have concluded that sometimes that subsidy is a one-time thing. Sometimes it's an annual thing because of high operating expenses, et cetera. Is your sense that business models in the US are such that a one-time offering of subsidy will be adequate? Or is this something that 10 years from now, five years from now, people are going to come back and say, I, I, I bid that. Yeah, I understand. I agreed to that. But I really need more money. So if this is done right, it's a one-off thing. It's like th this doesn't require some equivalent of universal service to prop up um, in perpetuity. What, the, the way the model works is the, the cost to deploy fiber to, to most of these homes on average, to all of these homes on average, is about $6,000 on, on our estimates. Um, if you, there's about a, a $3,000 subsidy available to all of the homes um, on average, which means you need about $3,000 of <laughs> private capital. That $3,000 of private capital is effectively the NPV shortfall on the investment. And so it takes into consideration your operating costs and all future maintenance capex in perpetuity. Um, so if it's, if it's done properly, this takes care of the problem forever. We never have to go back um, and, and prop these, these initiatives up with, with additional subsidies in the future. It requires, though, putting the subsidies into the hands um, of companies that really know what they're doing. So Ardolf is sort of the best example of what not to do in so many respects. It's a, it's a great example of what not to do in the, in the respect of who you give the capital to. Give it to companies that have scale, a demonstrated track record, know what they're doing. And you know, it, it's helpful to give it to companies um, that are sort of permanently at the mercy of regulators. So if AT&T um, and Comcast and Charter and Verizon um, are receiving subsidies to uh, close, the, close the gap in these 14 million homes, um, or if they're sort of big recipients of the subsidies to close the gap in these 14 million homes, there's, there's no way. Um, first of all, if they come back and ask for, mo for, for more money in 10 years, um, the regulators are going to go and tell them to pound sand and there's nothing they can do about it. They're, you know, they're generating profits 
in 90% of the cu country um, uh, that can easily support the portion of the country um, that, gets, that gets subsidized. But secondly, you know, these, are, these are companies that can't afford not to fulfill the mandate um, that, they, um, that they commit themselves to um, because of the operations they have across the rest of the country. So that's going to be, you know, probably for this crowd, a very unpopular um, uh, statement. I think there's, a, there's a, a desire to see subsidies go to municipalities, nonprofits, minority-owned businesses. Um, and I think all of those things are really important, but we've got to go back to the hierarchy of, uh, of objective. What are you really trying to, like, if you can achieve one thing, what would it be? It would be, let's ensure that we've got access, make all of the other priorities secondary to, to, to that. Okay, John, you had something yeah, to add? Yeah, if I ask Jonathan a question about one of the numbers he sure. um, uh, put out there, which is a $3,000 of private capital. Does that number depend at all on the existence of the ACP consumer subsidy for service? Does, uh, no, it like doesn't. If that subsidy is there, does that make the investment more attractive for private capital? Yes, it does. But that yeah. 3000 it does not depend on uh, that subsidy. Uh, yeah, so okay. the 3,000 assumes penetration of about 70%, mm, okay. um, which is you know, 10 to 15 points below the national average, um, which sort of takes into consideration that these are on average lower income um, areas and therefore you wouldn't have penetration at the same levels as you would on a national basis. Throw in ACP in perpetuity and you know, that goes up the subsidy required uh, goes down. Okay, so yeah. Jonathan, you've added something that states are really gonna have to pay a lot of attention to, and that is when you select the funding recipients, they need to be people that you can depend upon. Uh, it, it, like you said, it may be nice to fund some startups and such, but that gets really, really, really difficult. Then to hold them accountable. Um, yep. The larger companies, you know, not necessarily larger, but companies who already have skin in the game it's a little bit harder, to, a little bit easier to work the enforcement mechanism. Yeah, this, this is the, the equivalent of sort of railroads or roads. It's, this is critical infrastructure um, for every household in America. And so I think certainty of execution has to be at the very top of the agenda of the states. We want to come out of this program in six or seven years and have accomplished the goal of getting broadband to, um, to every home in America. And if, if states haven't achieved that, They've got the opportunity to achieve that now with this program. If they don't achieve that, they should look at their efforts as abject failure. Um, and if they achieve that, it's you know, unqualified success. And if they achieve that more, that's you know, anything over and above that, uh, above that is gravy. But I think putting at risk the primary goal of getting broadband to every household in America would be a huge mistake. Michelle, you had something to add? Yeah. So unfortunately, all these thoughts are going through my mind. But so couple things I do want to throw out there. Firstly, um, I, I agree in terms of being certain that people can you know, uh, accomplish what they're, what they're saying that they will do for a certain price. Um, but I worry about saying, oh, and it should therefore be the people who are already doing 80% of the work. I'll give an example. So, and at this point, I think um, Starlink needs to send me gadgets because I, I keep help talking about them. Um, <laughs> New, new low Earth orbit satellite services have been proving quite successful. Uh, they didn't exist until a couple years ago. So I want to make the plug that I think something that's tech, more technology neutral in this approach would, would be good. And I certainly don't think we want to have policies that are somehow entrenching um, or limiting competition against incumbents. So that's just one thing. But uh, something else that, that I'm, I think you were, I like the way you were phrasing, like, like it's gonna, you know, there's a, a present value calculation. Um, but if you, if we think about the middle class affordability, right? So your, your, your um, accounting there wasn't including ACP, but it also was not including the, the risk that there could be some pricing control on middle class, which can be defined really in a million different ways. And this is a general equilibrium in the sense that not only are 
are firms going to go, okay, of the unserved or underserved areas, where do we want to bid? But also, they can invest elsewhere, right? So let's think about if we were thinking about the middle class affordability, some price regulation there, what is that going to impact on the, at the margin? Where a private company is going to go? Well, middle class, that's going to be a majority. I think that's going to be a huge portion of any subscriber group. So if I could go there, but there's a risk that I'm going to get price regulation there if I accept this money, and that price regulation costs me a lot, then I'd rather avoid that risk. On the flip side, my concern is, let's suppose this does go through and impose, and, and, and there, it is really introduction to price regulation. And there are a couple issues with that, beyond the, the fact that it would diminish the uh, reduction in the accessibility issue, um, is that once it's, it's out there, oh, well, middle class affordability, why should it only be in certain areas? Why, you know, once that's established as an option, then there's going to be a huge push for it to be nationalized. And I think the last thing we need in the United States is for the government to be regulating the price um, of something that is very useful and people are willing to pay for it, and uh, you know, there's no reason why they can't. And, and to, to John M's point earlier, when we're talking about distortions of subsidies, right? You want the general base and then targeted. Well, so it, if if you're giving money or subsidizing consumers who have a willingness to pay and an ability to pay, then what are we really doing? We're just giving them $30 of extra disposable income. Okay, fine. But if we want to do that, we can do that without creating many, as many distortions, right? If I just want to give someone $30, let me give them $30 and they can do what they want with it. Um, so when we're deciding not only that it's going to be an income subsidy to them, but how they should use it, we're imposing our preferences on them. And that might be tremendously uh, important. So John <laughs> was saying uh, that you found that, that uh, households who did adopt, that helped them with their learning process and kind of bring them into things. So that, that has value. And I do want to correct myself, and you mentioned it correctly, that on the Comcast thing, it was 66% were new subscribers. I, I had yeah, flipped that, that number, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, so let me get let, correct that. Um, so it, it can have value, but if we're talking about a truly middle income household who has a willingness to pay, then we're creating all these kinds of distortions and a huge tax burden to help, a burden on the providers to provide service. It, it, it's just a mess. Okay, so I think you've already answered the question I was going to ask you, I alerted you, I was going to ask you about if you create a program and you start adding stakeholders, it becomes harder to undo it, adapt it, change it as we go down the road. So that's something always as a policymaker to pay attention to. Right, I mean, entitlement programs, which is, well, but any program where, where you're getting something directly, you're a stakeholder and you're, you're not gonna wanna give that up. Okay. Whether but, it, it's an efficient, policy or not, you're not going to want to give that It works well up. for me. It works for me. All right, yeah. And once we are the majority, why would we give it up? Okay. All right. John Horgan, you wanted to jump in on this? I was so just going to say, I, I sort of feel Mayo. compelled ahead. to say three cheers for incrementalism, um, which should be, a, I think, a sort of comfortable posture for policymakers, meaning in, in your summary comments earlier, Mark, you, you mentioned this. We have experience... A, decade old with low income uh, offers for qualifying households. Comcast did it, other carriers have done it. ACP largely emulates that. Um, there's gonna be discussion about eligibility criteria going forward, but generally um, I, I think the circumstantial evidence is that um, things have gone reasonably well with ACP, which is sort of an incremental uh, way of, of building upon uh, something like Internet Essentials, you start to get to this muddy space of middle-class affordability plans, um, it 
it, it, seem, it seems like there should be a quit while one is ahead with incrementalism working for you as far as getting a subsidy that seems to be rolling out fairly effectively to the target population that we know has need, whereas this ill-defined other population may not really have much of a problem to solve for. Okay, yeah. Jonathan? Yeah, can I jump in on that? So it's actually, it's, it's really easy to, to solve, I think. So I think Michelle is 100% correct that if you impose rate regulation, you kill the impetus for private capital to come in these markets, and it's just not gonna happen. The, you know, $42.5 billion just doesn't solve the problem. Um, so the, the solution is, like the, the litmus test the state should be using is what um, increases or decreases returns for private capital coming into the market. If you shrink the, um, uh, the revenues that the operator can get, you're gonna chase away private capital. If you increase the revenues that the operator can get, you do the opposite. So if, if you know, a, a low-income um, plan that's narrowly and thoughtfully targeted that doesn't deplete the market that would otherwise pay for the service, but expands the market to people who wouldn't otherwise be able to pay for the service, that has a positive impact mm -hmm. on the returns to private capital. Um, it doesn't discourage it whatsoever. But Michelle's 100% right that if you have sort of any threat of, remember, you don't make money um, on, you don't make a, you don't break even on this investment until you're sort of six, seven, eight. Um, it takes you another five years before that, beyond that, before you started making it an attractive return. If there's any prospect that, of rate regulation at any point over that time frame, it just doesn't make sense to invest private capital into, in, into these kinds of um, initiatives. And, and to Michelle's point, it's gonna go elsewhere. Okay, uh, we'll come back to that later if we have time, because I, I think that's an important thing. We've, we've got a lot of dynamics moving right now, and so we'll come back to that issue. Um, John Mayo, let me come back to you. And I'm gonna shift the topic just a little bit to getting back to some of the, the middle class programs. Jonathan correctly pointed out that, that NTIA has several options, you know, they say the states need to do something, they just don't much say what. But one of the options that they laid out intrigued me, and that was to say, encourage structural competition. They didn't explain what that was, but we've done this before. Europe had its ladder of investment, the US had unbundling and network connectivity, interconnection. So we've tried these things, if I understand correctly what NTIA might have in its mind. What have we learned from these efforts in the past? Well, like you, I stumbled on the notion of what we mean by structural competition. And what was a little self-reflective for me was that I, I thought, how is it that I don't understand this term? I'm an economist studying competition for the last 30 years. And in fact, I wrote an article three years ago about the evolution of the term competition since the time of the mercantilists in the 1500s. And I didn't come across that phrase. So, so I, I will say that I struggled with it as well. Uh, the, um, if I tried to read something good into this phrase, what I would say is that as economists, uh, we have seen competition do some wonderful things. And, and having intense competition, generally speaking, improves the efficient allocation of resources. In this particular instance, however, what you've got is an industry in which for some substantial share of the country, population densities are high enough and incomes are high enough that, um, that it becomes possible for not one or two, but numerous broadband providers to compete, to compete within the market. So there's a competition within that market the idea of making sure as a policy matter that that competition is as intense as it can be is a good thing. But that's not really the focus of the BEAD program. The focus of the BEAD program is to enhance deployment in markets where there have been zero providers. <laughs> not, not numerous providers, but zero providers. And there, the idea that we're gonna get 
competition among multiple providers is really a non-starter. Uh, go and it doesn't mean we're completely out of luck. We can go back to some seminal research that was done by a professor named Harold Dimsetz in the 1960s that argued that in those special instances, you don't you might not be able to have competition within the market, but you could have competition for the market. And that's precisely what I might envision is going to happen in this case, is that if you do it right and create those attractive conditions that Jonathan was just speaking about, you will have multiple bidders to compete for the right to supply the market. You're not going to get multiple providers, but you'll get competition for that market and the benefits of that competition. Again, it was, I think, an awkward phrase by the, um, by the crafters, uh, and, and I think we can just maybe put that one to bed. Okay, all right, very good. Uh, so let me shift away from that topic then. Um, John Horgan, so NTIA suggests that if states have money left over, they've, they've distributed subsidies to get broadband built in unserved and underserved areas. They've done a really good job with the competitive processes. They have money left over. NTIA says, well, you know, you can do some things with that. Uh, maybe there's a middle class subsidy that could be provided to address that middle class affordability issue. What are your thoughts on that approach by the states? Or, or is there better use for the money? NTIA talks about uh, these leftover funds as um, non-deployment uses of bead funds um, if you've allocated all the money in, in such a way that you think your coverage problem is solved. So, so what are those? Um, they list um, wiring uh, community anchor institutions, libraries, hospitals, et cetera. So if those... If you have places in your state where uh, institutions such as that have insufficient bandwidth, you can spend money to um, run networks there. Uh, but there are also another, uh, a number of uses um, uh, pertaining to, um, say, job training uh, for digital skills for jobs of the future. So you might give grants to um, entities that provide training in digital skills for jobs that require digital skills. You may use some of those non-deployment, uh, some of those non-deployment uses could include, for instance, hiring digital navigators at public libraries who are the um, sort of the ground troops that go out to help the older people learn um, what's worthwhile uh, in terms of having internet connectivity and then how to um, use a computer, use a cell phone, et cetera. Um, those strike me as, um, and I should say that in many states, there's an existing infrastructure or an existing capacity of institutions who know how to do this. So you're not just um, uh, throwing money out there uh, or potentially throwing money out there to people who don't know how to use it. Those strike me, um, certainly starting with the community anchor institution um, uh, part of this, as um, worthwhile uses for non-deployment uh, uses. Uh, digital skills training strike me as a, a very effective use. Um, Nobody today has been a fan of this middle class affordability idea. I'm, I'm not going to get on that bandwagon for non-deployment uses. Okay, let me follow up with something then. So I know the Technology Policy Institute, which is local here, has done work on the, the programs to help low-income people be on, be, be on the network and, and use it effectively. I think one of their conclusions, I'm not sure if you were involved in this particular research or not, I just want your opinion on it, was that nationwide, statewide programs for that don't tend to work because you have to adapt to local conditions. What are your thoughts on that? I do think that these are local challenges better solved at the local level than, say, statewide programs. It is likely going to be the case, uh, particularly with Digital Equity Act funding, that the money goes to the states and then the states figure out how to spend money for those purposes. But that will entail states um, giving grants to localities to carry out, the, to execute uh, the digital skills training, for instance. And um, most uh, medium-sized cities have digital equity coalitions that can serve as useful capacity for knowing how 
to guide those funds effectively. Um, but it is, um, I, I would agree with the notion that getting money to local localities is, is better than a top-downish approach that the states um, that the states run. Right. Michelle, I'm going to come back to you and bring us back to some of the price issues. So it appears to me NTIA has two unstated assumptions that, that bother me. Um, one assumption is that a state broadband office has sufficient skills and expertise to accomplish goals by trying to influence prices. Setting prices is really, really hard to do well and to, to be able to adapt those to, to different situations. So that assumption bothers me. Another is that the broadband market, the technology markets are sufficiently stable that you can set a policy today and it's going to work for the foreseeable future. Um, to use Jonathan's numbers, it's going to have to work for the next decade. Um, what are your thoughts on, on this? Well, generally, I don't like government trying to set prices okay. <laughs> on average. Um, but uh, certainly, I, I, I take your point, and I think that's true um, that, well, I, I, I wouldn't know if the federal setting of price would be better or worse than states, but I don't think either would do a good job if, if they're trying to regulate these prices. Um, and there are lots of cases to, 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 to demonstrate that price regulation doesn't tend to have the desired outcomes and, and has, does tend to have huge uh, costs. Um, the second point, uh, what was the second? Oh, it was on the stability of the marketplace so that you actually could have a pricing policy that right. could endure. Right, well, so, so the thing is, well, so two, two things. One to mention, just because we haven't said it explicitly, when they're talking about the low cost uh, plan or potential middle class affordability plans, they're saying that um, the ISP who received these funds would have to maintain that throughout the existence of that infrastructure. So there, it is a long term term component. But uh, I think what you're trying to get at is, is the, the idea that th this is actually a very competitive environment. Uh, internet service provision is quite competitive in most of the United States. I mean, clearly not in unserved areas, but it, it's a very competitive industry. And we can see that there's new entry all the time. Uh, people tend to think it's not moving that much, but it, it, when, if you actually look at data as to where people are providing, it's not that the numbers of, of providers are necessarily uh, always increasing. It's that there's always new people coming in, some people going out, and there, there's a lot of turnover in that sense. So these are very competitive markets, and technology changes all the time. As you know, as the introduction of low Earth orbit as a a very reasonable alternative to um, to other technologies, uh, I think there's a, a real risk that you're if you're you're establishing a price, it's going to be very hard to get rid of that regulation. You don't know if you're setting it too high, too low, and it's going to distort everything for a very very long time. Thank you, John Mayo. Let me turn to you. Michelle, earlier in our conversation, brought up the challenge that if you have a particular set of requirements for broadband companies that provide, excuse me, that receive bead funding, and a different set of regulatory rules for those that, that don't, or at least at areas that don't, you know, how does that dynamic then work itself out? And I was wondering what your thoughts would be on that, especially in the context where last week, the FCC chairperson said, we'd like to have Title II regulatory authority. Don't worry, we're not going to regulate prices, but we would certainly have the authority to. Well, let me give a glass half full, glass half empty answer. Uh, if you were to say, uh, take the glass half full perspective, you'd, let's compare the, the differences in it that are possible intertemporally with the BEAD program and some earlier programs. They'll be different, and we have the opportunity, not the guarantee, but the opportunity to do BEAD better than we had in prior programs. Cross-sectionally, I'm more worried. Uh, there you've got, uh, you've got cable companies, you've got telcos, uh, you've got other broadband providers, and the, the risk of introducing regulations in this particular program is that there's contagion into 
those other more programs. And I think we've sort of touched on this tangentially, but, but if these become popular, uh, not efficient necessarily, but popular, then there may be a, a, a political pressure to take those regulations, not in the, and not even called price regulation, over into other broadband spaces. And then you start running into the, into the problems that, uh, that we've talked about here in terms of attracting capital in those markets to begin with. And the final thing I'd do is just simply foot stomp your point that, that if, in fact, if, in fact, you're uh, a possible bidder in, a, in an area, in a, in a state, and now you look at, counterfa at, at, at the counterfactual of, oh, I, now I've got a bid with the prospect that I may be subject to uh, Title II regulation of, of my services, that certainly is going to affect the values that I'm willing to bid, and, and not in a healthy way. Jonathan, you're the financial person. What are your thoughts on that issue? That there's, it, it'll take at least two years, maybe longer, for what the FCC is proposing to actually play out. In the meantime, people are making some large financial commitments. From a financial analyst perspective, how does that affect your willingness to put private capital in? So, you know, if there is a prospect of rate regulation at any point in the next 20 years. Um, private capital is not going to come in to back these subsidies and drive the investment that's required. It's just, it's, it's not going to happen. I think we did a call on, um, on net neutrality this morning where we sort of highlighted what we thought the sort of the risks were for, for investors in the sector. Um, I think we're re-regulating re the sector, the broadband services title to to implement um, some net neutrality principles, which by and large are completely irrelevant to uh, the operators and, and returns in the sector. It just doesn't matter. To your point, though, it gives the FCC the ability to regulate rates, mandate wholesale access, um, which uh, are potentially very damaging. To John's point, they've relinquished their authority to do those two things. Um, as long as that comes through very clearly in the NPRM and ultimately in the rules, I think it's fine. If all we're doing here is creating inf a, a regulatory infrastructure to enforce some principles that everybody does anyway, who cares? Um, but if it, you know, so, so it all comes down to the strength of the forbearance um, around Section 201 and 202. Um, the, you know, if it's clear that the FCC is really forbearing from their ability to regulate rates, then we can stop talking about Title II and net neutrality um, and get on with things. I think I also just want to quickly reinforce a point that John made and the point that, that Michelle made, because they're, they're really, really important. So the, the, on the point of um, why we don't want rate regulation um, in the sector in general and in, in the areas that we're driving these subsidies to in particular is because this isn't like roads where you build them once and they, they sit there for 60 years. This is a, a, a technology-driven infrastructure that's going to need continuous upgrades. Every five, six, seven years, um, this infrastructure needs to be upgraded. We're going through a massive upgrade for all of the cable infrastructure in the country um, at the moment over the course of the next three years. You've got to, at inception, fund all of those future upgrades um, that, that are going to be required. And you do that through the sort of the mechanism that we've, just, that we've just spoken about. If you implement rate regulation based on a model that exists today, what we end up with is something like DSL. If you think that you know, what we have right now is all that consumers will ever need, and this sort of goes back to why we don't want to fund um, experimental uh, technologies for this, you end up with something that looks great today that five years down the road, uh, it, it's no longer adequate. And the households that are sort of left with what you thought was adequate today are, are then left behind relative to the rest of the country where infrastructure is, is progressing at a, at a far faster rate. The second point I wanted to make was just with respect to structural competition. It's actually really simple if you sort of think about it economically, which is you need a fixed cost infrastructure to provide broadband. So $6,000 per home um, or business served 
in order to deploy it and a, and a fixed cost to, to um, serve that infrastructure on an ongoing basis. There is revenue available to provide an adequate but not fantastic return on that um, to one provider who gets 70% of the market. If you double the fixed cost and halve the amount of revenue that they're going to get, you completely obliterate the prospect of anybody making a return in this market. Mm -hmm. Not only won't the guy that, you know, the, the, neither market participant can make a return um, under, under, these, un, uh, under those circumstances. So it makes, it makes, again, we've got to go back to the hier hierarchy of objectives. Objective number one is let's get access to these areas. If you want people to have choice, that's a, like a lovely objective, but that's got to come secondary to the objective of, of getting access in the first place. And anything that defeats the first objective should be, should be ruled out. All right, very good. John? Let me, let me put one more stake in the vampire of, stru okay. of structural competition, because what we've spoken about are literally two providers investing the physical capital. What you raised earlier, Mark, was, was something that I didn't address earlier which is, is a road we've been down before, which is to try to introduce competition by effectively requiring sharing of physical facilities. Uh, it didn't work in telecommunications for a variety of reasons, but, but for purposes today, I think you have to again ask the question, what would it do to uh, potential bidders' incentives to enter into provide broadband service if that broadband if that provider is making the physical infrastructure investments with a requirement that it share those physical assets with all comers and i think i think the answer is it wouldn't happen okay so um, i'll have uh, john horgan i'm going to ask you a question about the, um, the low incomes preferences for wireline versus wireless, because in, in the telecom world, we discovered that part of the problem with low income household penetration was that wireline just did not work for them. This was in Florida anyway. They said, we just move too much. People come in and use our stuff. We, but once mobile became available, then it all took off. I want to ask you about that with respect to broadband. Uh, before I do that though, uh, just to tell the, the audience in about three minutes, uh, we will go open up things for the audience to, uh, to ask questions, and so um, uh, please be ready to do that. You can email them in or put them on, on Twitter um, at uh, ask, excuse me, hashtag ask AEI tech. All right, but before, okay, so Jonathan, tell us, because you alluded to it before about wireless wireline, how does that play into how low-income households use the internet? So with AC, I'm gonna play this out in the, in the context of ACP, the Affordable Connectivity Program. In early days, overwhelming numbers showed that um, ACP subscribers were using it for wireless, not wireline. Uh, something like uh, two-thirds to one-third. Um, as the program rolled out, um, those numbers started to reverse to be two-thirds wireline, one-third wireless. So that today, the latest data I've looked at, um, it's around 50-50, uh, meaning ACP uh, fifty percent of ACP subscribers use it for wireline. Fifty percent use it for wireless. Um, what you find out when you start to look at the patterns of usage among lower-income households is that, like everyone else, they wa they value um, having two modes of connectivity: wireless and wireline. Oftentimes, they can't afford both. They choose one. They choose wireless because it's the Swiss Army knife. Uh, kind of uh, d device for, for multiple uses on the go, phone, internet, et, et cetera. Um, so the ACP subsidy oftentimes uh, helps people um, get to two, uh, which is the norm for access in this country right now to have two modes of access to the internet, wireless and wireline. Um, and some, uh, in some house, you know, households um, let their preferences play out. Um, I have heard discussion uh, in terms of we should make sure that ACP is used for wireline because they get a big pipe and uh, no data caps and that's what we want so they can do school online, which is true. However, households may choose different means to get there. They may want to um, 
use that subsidy for their wireless for reasons having to do with the carrier and what that carrier offers, and they can afford that. Um, maybe they can still get that $15 a month offer from a, from a cable company for a low-income offer. So um, it, it, competition is actually a good thing and, and I think is being demonstrated to be a good thing in ACP as the wireless carriers and the wireline carriers um, com compete to uh, get the people to enroll and then households have a choice and they can make those choices uh, for themselves, benefit from the $30 off, um, but uh, um, they, they get to figure out which circumstance suits them best. All right, very good. So thank you all very much. Let me turn to the audience. Questions from the audience for our panelists or online, either one. Okay, Shane. So I've lived in Washington DC since for a long time and I remember in the mid 90s we thought we would never get cable because we knew that people would not pay off the mayor at the level that he'd finally agree to. And it took us a long time to get there. So I feel like there's lots of layers to this that we haven't really considered into what's going on. And let's go back to the whole net neutrality challenge because no, you know, no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization. These were never a problem. And now we have network slicing and we have network virtualization and software defined networking. And there's all these great things to the point that the panels are making of, we don't want to lock in one thing that one mayor is going to decide on that's going to trap a city into one thing for a long time or whatever it's going to be. So if you guys had the chance to use this money the way you think it should be used, give us some suggestions, because we've heard a lot of the challenges within the parameters of these programs, but I'm kind of giving you a, give us a blue sky moment here. Let us just dream for a moment. Is it, which one do you want to dream first? To dream first. Okay. <laughs> Anyone? What? So Michelle, you, you moved your arm, so we'll, we'll let you go first. <laughs> I mean, I've spoken on this issue a lot, so, so I mean, I would make sure that you, you want people to come to the table, and you want them to come to the truly unserved areas. And in order to do that, you need to make sure you're defining unserved areas correctly, that you're not overinflating the speeds that are required to be considered unserved, because if you do that, then underserved areas will get same you know, preferences or same, um, yeah, preferences as unserved areas. And clearly, if I'm a company, I'd rather go to a wealthier area that already has service but is now, you know, being kind of falsely labeled unserved than going to an unserved, a truly unserved area that has lower economic pro uh, prospects. Similarly, so once we define correctly and narrowly, because I want the money to go where it's actually needed, not just to do overly services right and left, but then don't mess with it in the sense of make it as attractive as possible for a company to come in. Don't you know, mandate direct unbundling, don't put in the risk of middle class affordability plans, uh, you know, reduce the cost by not mandating you know, all buy American, uh, reduce the cost by not mandating unionized labor, things like that. So, so focusing it in the right places and then just making it as clean as possible. Anyone else? John. So I'm gonna say the same thing as Michelle, but I'm gonna reorder it a little bit. And, and it goes back to the points I made about the lessons we've learned from research in this area on prior programs. We need to, number one, understand what the goal of the BEAD pro program is. From my perspective, the singular goal is really to enhance deployment in unserved areas and to be very explicit about what those subsidies are and not allow implicit subsidies to creep in. You know, if someone were to mandate, for instance, that low-cost plan, I'll just say counterfactually, that suppose someone were to mandate that the, the price not be $30 a month, but be $3 a month. At that point, you've introduced an implicit subsidy and a guarantee that that subsidy is going to have to continue forever in contrast to the advice that we've been given fund this thing broadly, that's happened, target it narrowly, and make sure as you can that, that the funds are allocated in a very competitive fashion, again, through a reverse auction mechanism. What else, Jonathan? Yeah, I would say, so I agree with all of those. Um, I think it's just imperative that the states think in terms of what the hierarchy is. So to John's point, let's make sure we get 
access funded. Um, to Michelle's point, let's not do anything that discourages the private capital that's required to come in to fund that access. Um, we've been fo focused mostly on low income and mid middle income pricing mandates here, but there's a list of other things that Michelle raised um, that would drive up the costs of deployment, reduce the prospect of private capital coming in, reduce the prospect that we get to all homes, um, such as the requirements to use unionized labor by America, et cetera. Those are all negative um, for the prospects of the, um, of the plan success. But I think if the states go into this with a very clear-headed view of you know, what's our primary objective and what's going to serve that objective, um, there's, a, there's a high chance of achieving something incredible here, which is solving the access problem once and for all. Okay. May, may I just sure, one wedge more time. in yeah. one point that I wanted to make also is that while I think the purpose of the BEAD program is deployment, it doesn't mean that, that we don't have uh, an affordability pro, uh, problem or, an, or a, uh, an access problem. But we, John Horgan has spoken and other people have looked at the ACP program which has to date, in, in relatively short order, subscribed 18 and a half million households. Uh, that program is showing all the indications that it is taking advantage of a lot of lessons that we've learned in the past about how to run an affordability program. So it's not as though I'm suggesting, or anyone should suggest, that we don't address that affordability prog program. We just need to do it through a proven mechanism, not through an unproven mechanism. Okay, and John Horgan wants to agree that he's brilliant, so go ahead. A dream within the hierarchy of Jonathan, um, which is prepare for, for digital skills training infrastructure at the community level, um, and states will have money, $2.75 billion under the Digital Equity Act, to do that. Um, and that will help with part of the hierarchy that Jonathan mentioned. But I do think preparing to get those resources into the communities that need them, which are going to be different communities probably, uh, although there will be some overlap, but they're going to be largely different communities than the bead communities that receive funding, is important. It's been shown to have payoffs, this kinds of, these kinds of digital skills training, and to build the capacity so that those funds are deployed effectively is very important because there is a risk with any grant program that the money gets frittered away in a wasteful fashion. It would be you know, a tragedy if that were to happen for digital skills training, I think is an avoidable one, but states and communities have to start planning for that now so they don't um, stand up stuff in a rush in a year or so and uh, waste a lot of money because there's only, Talk about only one shot for bead for solving this problem. There's only one shot to use those digital equity funds uh, 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 correctly, in my view. Okay. Michelle, and, and then I'm going to move over here for a question. That I, I did forget to mention, along with the reverse auction idea, right? That we want this to be competitive. We want it to be technology neutral. Fiber might be the exact perfect solution for certain areas, but it might not be for others, especially when we're talking very rural areas that are not densely populated or might be mountainous. We need to focus on what will get service to an area, and that as long as it satisfies what we think is necessary, be agnostic as to what technology that should be. Because otherwise, we're going to spend a lot of money on fiber and potentially run out before we get out. OK, very good. Question over here. Form. We talked a lot about the calculations that companies are making, whether to participate, and whether to invest. How significant, if you've looked at the numbers here, how significant of a cost are things like right-of-way access, pole attachment fees, um, zoning, uh, permitting, those kind of more boring but like on-the-ground issues? How much of a role do those play in these calculations? And is that something locality should be thinking about, maybe streamlining and, and lowering those costs? Definitely. Johnson? So. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it, it all matters. The, so what I would say is, is two things. First of all, dealing with pole attachment costs and rights of way and the whole regulatory, sort of local regulatory process around approvals is a nightmare. Um, but 
the the companies um, can make can, can sort of make this program successful despite all of that regulatory headwind that exists today. So we don't have to transform um, the all of those processes for this program to be successful. But if we can streamline all of those processes and strip a lot of cost um, and a headache out of the system, the prospect of getting to 100% um, of the problem with the best available infrastructure um, goes way up. And then the prospect that there's going to be money left over um, for all of the secondary objectives of affordability, um, education, et cetera, um, goes up as well. So it's you know, undoubtedly um, a, you know, th things that we should be focused on, on, on trying to accomplish while we're, we're going through the process um, of spending all of this money. All right, any other questions? Two questions from okay. the online audience. The first one is from Danielle, and she asks, how can governments and service providers work together to ensure affordable broadband access for all, especially in underserved or rural areas? All right, a best practice. What, what should they do? John, I'm, you're about to speak. Yeah, go John, ahead, please. I'm, I mean, I would just, if I'm a rural area thinking about how to roll this out, uh, today I would think about this in coordination with the Affordable Connectivity Program um, because uh, it's for the reasons Jonathan w w was talking about. Um, there, are, there, are, there is a notion some, in some quarters that affordability is largely a phenomenon in urban areas. It's not. It is equally important in rural areas. And to you know, use the affordable connectivity program as a way to kind of prime the customer base and do that in coordination with the infrastructure build out, I think could be an effective way to, to get to that goal. Anyone else want to chime in? Kate, you had another one? The other question is from Tevin Taglang. And he asks, if bead funds are building networks where we're not going to see competition and there is no rate regulation, what is protecting consumers from high pricing for a service that we all seem to admit is essential? Thoughts on that? So I've got a thought. Sure. Um, if you give the, um, if you give the funds to a company who's only business is serving um, the, the, this sort of pocket of unserved homes. Once you've distributed the money, you've got very little recourse um, to make sure that it's sort of spent effectively, that consumers are being well served, um, that they're not being price gouged. If you give it to companies that are serving households on a national basis, um, you've got a much higher chance that the job's going to get done, um, that those, the, those uh, communities and households are going to get served, um, and that they're not going to engage in um, uh, price gouging. Because the consequences across their, their entire business is way too large for them to take on that risk. John? So, um I've advocated, and others have as well, a reverse auction to, to ensure that the provider is able to provide the service at the lowest possible cost. That's part of the answer, but that's only, only part of the answer. The, the other part of the answer is, what's the price going to be for the provider in that market if there were a single provider, for instance? And here... We've done a little bit of maybe a fair amount of bashing of the low-cost uh, plan as it's being sort of talked about by the NTIA, but that's not actually an NTIA uh, issue, it, or it is an NTIA issue, but the language for a low-cost plan originated in the statute, in the, in the IAJA, the Infrastructure Investment for Jobs Act. So it's a, it, it is actually a requirement of the statute that, that there be a low-cost plan. There are ways, I suspect, I believe, to implement a low-cost plan to ensure that, that prices 
generally will be uh, available and reasonable for, for consumers in the marketplace. There's something else that I would throw in is you might think about it in terms of, of uh, having adoption objectives as opposed to price controls. Because we could think in terms of, all right, so we require the deployment of the network throughout. Once we've achieved that, the provider's incentive to monopoly price goes way down because its additional costs are really small of actually signing someone up. So I would think perhaps in adoption terms as opposed to price terms, let the market work out the prices, but you've got a goal of this many people being connected to using broadband, and that is, is something I would include, perhaps include in how I, and what I discuss with the operators. John. You know, just to, to follow on, one additional statutory requirement, I think, is, or no, I'm sorry, this is not a statutory requirement, this is a requirement of the NTIA, and that is, that they're looking at effectively requiring low-cost plans to be supplemented by the requirement that the, that the entity providing that broadband service offer the ACP, uh, which, which provides discounts for uh, households that are, that are eligible and low income. So for both those reasons, I think, I think you're, I'm less concerned about uh, what Jonathan referred to as price gouging in this instance. There's one other thing I would, would offer uh, to follow up on something Jonathan had been talking about, and that is the qualification of who's going to receive the, the, the money. This is getting away from pricing a little bit, but I was struck by a lesson from Brazil. Uh, this wasn't in broadband. This was telecommunications in general. They had a very explicit objective that we want small companies building in rural areas. And, and so the big companies, OE, Vivo, could not get money. You had to be a small company to expand in telecommunications, get subsidies in those rural areas. And they succeeded in that. They had hundreds of companies, as I recall the number, but now they're all consolidating. Um, so there is, there's a scale economy issue that uh, I would encourage states to, to think about, that the markets will play out, the finances will play out. That's just a reality for all the companies. And understanding how that, that works, I think, would be put that states way ahead. But I have one more question for each of you, then we need to wrap up. And it is simply this. If you had one piece of advice that you could offer to a state on any issue, even though we've been focusing on pricing, any issue, what would that one piece of advice be? And we're just going to go down the row. So John Mayo, we'll start with you, and Michelle will get the last word. John? And this is a piece of advice about broadband, not about, about state football or you know, anything They else. should all be Florida Gator fans. Yeah. Yes, you're right. <laughs> I, I knew that's where we were going. Um, so this is, we've used the word dynamic and fluid uh, a few times here today. No doubt about it, the implementation of this is in uncharted territory. And we've got 50 states doing it potentially differently. And there are going to be missteps, no doubt about that. What I might think is a very good idea at this point is to have a little bit of a reversal of, of the uh, requests. Right now, NTI is requesting or demanding certain things from the states. I might imagine that the states request or demand of NTI a database that says, here's what we're doing, and, and, and get that on the table in various dimensions so that two years, three years, five years from now, those states with the very best practices are able to transfer that knowledge to states that have not been as successful as they would have liked to have been. All right, thank you. John Horrigan. Build assessment of your programs into the rollout of the infrastructure deployment and other programs relating to digital equity that will uh, roll out. Build assessment in so that you'll have an answer to the question in five years, how did it go? Um, if you're a state, you want to be able to present an answer, not be reactive to what others may throw at you. So build assessment in. Jonathan? Um, so at the risk of sounding repetitive, um, I would say that uh, have one clear objective, which is to get broadband to all the homes in your state that don't have broadband today. And everything you do should be 
focused on servicing that one clear objective. And to John's point, um, the assessment that we should, you should be um, measuring yourselves on is did you get broadband everywhere? Did you provide access to every, every um, home in your state? And it was, was it the best possible access? Um, and if you didn't achieve that, then you failed. Michelle. I think we, we have a unanimous decision or a unanimous uh, recommendation. And so I'm just going to rephrase what's, what's been said. Assessment and data. But let me be clear. Assessment doesn't just mean, and how many households do you pass or provide service? It's how many new households are now being provided service that weren't before, because that's a very different assessment. And, and so assessment in this case is not just saying, OK, you said you're going to do x, y, or z. Yes, we want assessment of that. But I think there's a larger opportunity here. And, and, and honestly, I mean, it's, it feels like a moral mandate for the NTIA, honestly, to say, we need data. But if the NTIA doesn't do it, as a state regulator, I would say, we need data on what is happening, what has occurred, and what are the marginal benefits of it. Not just what are you providing, but what are you providing to people who didn't have service before, or what's the marginal improvement in the quality of the service that they have received, so that there's an actual sense of whether or not things have been efficient, um, efficiently used, money has been efficiently used. All right, well, thank you all very much. Um, I will add dittos to the gathering of data. Um, and it has to be gathered well, because data is actually hard to gather well. I can point to all kinds of horror stories of tons of data gathered by a federal agency, and none of it's usable. Uh, too many apples, oranges, carrots, radishes involved. You just you can't do anything with it. Uh, but adaptation evaluation are indeed key. So thank you, Michelle. John uh, Horrigan, John Mayo, and Jonathan for the insights that you have shared. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone here and, and online as well for joining us. Please watch for future events from the American Enterprise Institute. Share your thoughts. Let us know what are the kinds of things that are on your mind that we could help you think about and that we could address. Thank you all very much. <laughs>